this group. Are y'all ready to study the scriptures together? Yes. Well, I am too. This is a, a good day, and and um, you know, it's something about scripture. I don't care where we read in scripture; it's just something that we're going to get out of it if we'll have ears to hear. And um, I hope that God will speak to you in, in the way that He's been speaking to me this week, because uh, His Word is good. The last couple of weeks we've been talking about follow Jesus' command for us to follow him and last week to, to take his yoke upon us and to, to come to him. Um, and it's called us, it's called me. I hope it's called you to evaluate where you are in your commitment, in your walk, in your relationship, and in obedience to Jesus as, as, as a disciple, as a follower of Jesus, as a follower of of Jesus Christ. And um, the truth is, is the reaction to this kind of call, it's not my call, it's Jesus' call. Jesus is the one who said to follow me. He's the one who said, come to me, <clears throat> all you who are weary and heavy laden. This is the words of Jesus. But I'm going to tell you, it, it brings at least three different responses. For some people, it is, they are, I mean, they're just, tapped right into it. God, I accept Jesus. I accept the call. I repent of where I've been and what I've done, and I'm coming to you right now. Boy, that's a good reaction. There's a second reaction that we see not only in our personal experiences, but we see it in Scripture. It's someone who's told to follow him, and they just walk away because the price is too high. See, coming to Jesus is not just a little commitment. It's everything. It's everything. And for some people, they walk away because they think the cost is too high. I guess you haven't walked away. You're still here, so that's a good thing. <laughs> but that happens with some people. But I'm going to talk about a third reaction today that, that I, and I hope I, somebody here needs to hear this today. Is there's a third reaction is when Jesus calls us to follow him, we begin an inner struggle and an inner conflict because it, um, it begins to weigh us down because we think it's just, you know, come on, Jesus, this, this is it's not realistic in this day and time, you know, to, to follow you. And it causes some people to have a lot of discouragement, and it causes some people to have a lot of sadness, and it causes a lot of people to think this is just not possible. And I'm going to tell you, I've got good news for you today. Do you want to hear it? Yes. It says, with men it is impossible, but not with God. Right. For with God, yes. all things are possible. Yes. Those aren't my words. Those are the words of Jesus. If we'll just hear it. Yes. With men, it is, it is impossible, but not with God. With God, all things are possible. Y'all have heard that before? Have y'all heard that verse before? And I, I have too, but I've, I've always thought about it in really in a different context. I've heard it from the, the, positive, the positive thinking people. You know, we just need to think positive. All things are possible. God, God's going to do it. It's just the power of positive thinking. That is not the context in which Jesus was bringing this word. And so I want us to kind of to look at it, to re-examine it. It's more than just the power of positive thinking. It reveals the power of God unto salvation for us. More importantly, it reveals the power of God's salvation for you. All things are possible. And you think the circumstances in your life, your ability to follow him with all of your heart is just impossible. With man, it is, but not with God. Because all things with God are possible. We're going to talk today um, about the true context in which Jesus spoke these words and what y'all, y'all probably, most of you probably know this story. It's the story about the rich young ruler. Um, and it comes from three different gospel accounts. It's, it's um, recorded in Matthew and Mark. It's in, in Matthew um, chapter 19, Mark chapter 10, and Luke 18. And Luke calls him a ruler, but doesn't say he's young. 
Matthew says he's a young man. So I, I love looking at the gospel accounts when they talk about the same account because they all have a little bit different addition. They're not inconsistent. You know, if, if three of us saw an accident, you know what we would all tell? A little bit different slant because you notice certain things or certain things that were important to you. And so I love to take accounts like that, blend them together and read and get all the details. Don't you think so? And so here, we, here we're going to look at the, the, the rich young ruler. And my guess is there's some of y'all who already know this story who say, oh, no, <laughs> not that sermon, not the one about selling everything. Yeah, that's what you're doing probably. You're already tuned out. I want, you, I want you to understand that's not all Jesus is talking about here. Just hang with me, please. Listen to the full story. Listen to what Jesus is really teaching to his disciples because he's trying to teach each and every one of us that our situation and our ability to follow him wholeheartedly is impossible for us, but it is not impossible for God. So Jesus is going out on a road, and it says in, in Mark, it says, one came running. That doesn't sound too dignified for a ruler, does it? And so he's running. He's following Jesus. He's following Jesus, and he says, he, the scriptures say he kneels before him. So here, Jesus is walking down the road. He's got his disciples with him, if you can get this image. And this young man who is obviously some person of importance, it's somebody we know he, who has lots of wealth and lots of possessions, he comes running up to Jesus in front of all of these people. This isn't some Pharisee trick in the in the temple where they're trying to trick Jesus, I really believe this young man is sincere and he's honest. He runs up to Jesus and he kneels down before him in front of all these people. And he asks, good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? The Matthew account says that he says, what good thing must I do? See, that's what he's learned about religion. It's about doing good things and those who do good things get good things. And he's a wealthy man and the wealth is the blessing of Father Abraham. Therefore, he's been doing some pretty good stuff or we wouldn't have so much good stuff, at least in his mind. But he knows that there's a problem somewhere. And Jesus responds to him and he says, why do you call me good? No one's good but one. And that is God. So young man, you're talking to God himself. You're speaking to God in the flesh. And Jesus continues and says, if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. And that's not something new. He's been hearing that all of his life. Every time he's gone to synagogue, they've talked about following the commandments. I'm sure his good Jewish mama always told him from the time he was a mere lad to say, go do the, follow the commandments, follow all the commandments, go back to the law, they study it. He's a son of the law. He's been studying the commandments all of his life. But yet he's still asking, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, C keep the commandments. He, he would have known the law. I mean, the law, I just want to read a little portion of it over in Deuteronomy. Y'all, sometimes we think that these Old Testament laws are dry. It is not dry. It is the essence of what God was trying to do with his people and the call. He says, I've set before you, this is in Deuteronomy 13, uh, 30. It's a great chapter. And, he, and, and Moses is saying, see, I've, I guess he's revealing what God is saying. He says, see, I've set before you today life and good and evil and death. And that I command you today to love the Lord your God to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments, his statutes, his judgment, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land in which you're, you're going to possess. I mean, they knew that the important thing for them to do was to follow the commandments. What Jesus is telling them is not something new. It's just a question of whether he was in obedience to that or not. And here in verse 19 of chapter 30 says, I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you that I've set before you life. What does he want? He wants life. And God is saying, I've set before you life and death. I've set before you life and death. 
blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life. God was telling him, I want you to choose this way. I want you to follow my ways because by doing that, you are going to choose life. This is not just life in the physical. It is life eternal. And he says, so that you and your descendants may live that you may love the Lord your God and that you may obey his voice and that you may cling to him for he is your life. And this young man who has heard this law all of his life knows there's something missing. You see, just following commandments and making sure we do the the commandments is not what gives us the satisfaction and the eternal understanding that we're in God's blessing. And Jesus is about to unveil and unmask this teaching and this understanding that this young man has had when he comes into him and asks him, what do I have to do to enter eternal life? And Jesus just says, keep the commandments. But the man asks, as recorded over in Matthew, says, which ones? <laughs> Isn't that strange? Two of the accounts don't mention it, but Matthew, it does. He asks him first, what do I have to do to enter eternal life? And then he's, and Jesus says, I want you to follow the commandments. Do the things your mama and daddy taught you. The things we taught Moses. And he says, which ones? You know, that's not so different than us. We want to make sure we're doing the biggies, but we kind of kind of get a little gray area on the smallies, right? Which ones? Which ones? <laughs> well, Jesus didn't talk about all of them because I understand there's hundreds of them. The Jewish, there were hundreds of them. Was there th three? 613. I've heard that before. 613. Jesus didn't have time to tell them all 613 right then. But... He's already supposed to know it. And he does know it. But he obviously must not be doing them all because he's saying, well, which, what, what are the big ones? What are the, what are the real ones here, Jesus? And Jesus starts off with some of the, ten, where you would think the Ten Commandments. And Jesus says, don't commit adultery. Check. Don't murder. Check. Don't steal. Check. Don't bear false witness. Check. Honor your father and your mother. Check, check. And Matthew adds, love your neighbor as yourself. Check, <laughs> check. He says, teacher, all these things I've kept from my youth. I've done all those. And there were a whole lot more that Jesus didn't mention. He says, but I've done those. And the young man asks another question to Jesus. He says, what do I still lack? What's missing? There must be something that I'm not doing right because I don't have this peace. I don't have this assurance. I don't have this understanding and knowledge. I don't have this relationship with God that I know that I need to have. I've been following lots of the commandments. Maybe not all of them, but enough of them where I ought to be feeling pretty good because you know I got lots of stuff, so therefore I must be doing enough right. That's what happens to us as we start seeing all the good things that happen in our life. We thank God. We Sometimes we kind of take the... I'm going to tell you the most dangerous times in my life is when things are going really well. I don't know about you because I take my foot off the gas and I'm not seeking God as much when things are all peachy and rosy. How about you? It's just the truth. It's just our pattern. So sometimes we look at the blessings that we have, we say, oh man, we, my relationship with God must be just where it's supposed to be. But if we're going to be real honest, like the young man says, he says, what do I still lack? What's missing? What, do I, what am I not doing here? See, Jesus didn't mention some of the other important ones like you shall have no other gods before you. He probably did. He said, you sh 
There's another commandment, do not covet. Don't want what other people have. He's a wealthy man. He wants to have the kind of things that other people in that level of income have. I want to have more. I want to have what they have. Jesus didn't mention that one. He didn't have to because he knew where the young man was. And Jesus didn't mention about following and walking in God's ways. He didn't mention about obeying his voice. He didn't mention, like we just read over in Deuteronomy, that you are to cling to God, to cling to him. Because he is your life. Let's go right now and put the scriptures up on Mark 10, verse 21. Jesus isn't mad at him, (laughs) this young man. I, I, I truly believe he's an honest seeker. He's really, he really wants, he wants to follow, because he sees something in Jesus that he is lacking. And Jesus It says, looking at him. Jesus Jesus saw him. Looking at him and he what? He loved him. What Jesus says is not because he was angry. It's not because he was upset, but it was because he loved him. And if you love someone, you're going to tell them the truth about their condition, aren't you? He's not going to give them false comfort and say, you know, young man, you're doing a pretty good job. Get on about your business. You're doing just fine. Jesus confronts him and causes him to see the very thing that is hindering his walk with God. He says, one thing you do lack, go your way, sell what you have, give to the poor. Oh, there we go. Okay, But he did say that. It's in what Jesus said to a lot of other disciples. In fact, this is the only account where I know that Jesus gave this instruction. But it was to this man. It was his remedy. But he didn't stop there. He says, you will have treasure in heaven. And come, come, take up your cross and do what? And follow me. What is the ultimate thing that Jesus knew this young man needed? It was to follow him. It was to follow him. It's the command command that he gives to each and every one of us. I want you to follow me. And for each person, what it is that hinders us is different. For this man, it was wealth. Truth is, compared to the world, we are all wealthy. If you've ever traveled to third world countries... We don't understand. Even the poorest among us is wealthy. But Jesus just lays it out there. He unmasks, he unveils, he exposes what it is that is hindering this young man from following him. Verse 22, this young man was sad at this word and he went away sorrowful. Why? Because he didn't want to give it up. He had great possessions. He had great possessions. To what did he cling? To what did he cling? It wasn't to God. In the way that he might have imagined. Verse 23. Since Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. And his disciples were astonished. His disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered again and said to him, Children, how hard it is for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel, let's get the flair of the dramatic here, with an image that you could see and for how impossible it would be. He said it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. He's talking about a person who's been blessed, who has all these blessings, who has all these answers to prayers. He's talking to someone who has now living their life. They are trusting in their riches. Could you imagine what the young man would have to tell his mama and daddy or why he sold all the stuff that had been given to him. You know, maybe it's not the attachment just to money. Maybe it's the attachment to what other people think and what other people are going to say.
Verse 26, and they were greatly astonished, saying among themselves, who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, with men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God all things are possible. That's the context. Doesn't sound like the power of positive thinking to me. What Jesus is telling them is you're right. All of you people who I'm calling, who are not following me, who are not 100% devoted to me, there are things that are hindering you and we've got to learn and make the decision to set them aside. But it is impossible, God. I can't do it. And Jesus says, exactly. That's the first step. You can't do it. But my God can. So are you just willing to be willing? God, if I had a million dollars, I'd give it to you. I don't got a million dollars, so I don't got to do it, I suppose. But the word is, but what are you doing with the $5 bill in your pocket? Uh, never know when you might need that thing, God. Kind of like on Clarence, and y'all remember the It's a Wonderful Life. He says, can you send me some money? He says, well, we don't use money up here. And Jimmy Stewart says, well, it comes in pretty handy down here, bub. <laughs> what we're accustomed to. That's what we're used to. We want to lay aside and, and have the extra for us because the truth is I'm really trusting in my own provision, my own wisdom, the blessings of God to take care of me. And Jesus is saying, I want you to change your focus. I want you to change your focus. And I want you to be exposed to what is it that hinders you from following me. It might not be wealth. For some of you, it might. Probably for most of it, it is, if we're real honest. But there are a lot of things we need to learn to put down. Maybe it's our career ambitions. Maybe it's our drive to be the best. Maybe it's our attachment to sports. Maybe it's our hobbies and the things we do that take up all of our time and all of our energies. Maybe it is that job that we're, we're not saying maybe what we need to say because we're worried that if we say that thing that we know God's put in our heart, we might not get that promotion we were expecting. I don't know what it might be. Maybe it's a relationship that you know is not a good relationship for you to be in. It's an unholy relationship. I'm not talking about your spouse. That's a good one, okay? So stay with your spouse. Stay with your children, take care of them, love them. But sometimes there are friends who draw us away, and I think Jesus is just saying there's some things that are hindering you. I don't know what it is for you. God has not revealed to me your secrets, so rest easy today, okay? Always used to make me nervous sometimes when people start preaching stuff that was pretty doggone close to home, and I said, what's God telling them about me? <laughs> Well, the truth is, God's the things He's speaking to, to me. He's speaking to you. I don't know what it is that's hindering you. Maybe it's the things that we do for pleasure that start crossing lines that we know we shouldn't be crossing. Maybe it's an addiction that we just fighting with and struggling with. I don't know what it is that is hindering you from following Jesus. Jesus knew exactly what it was like not to, to just put things down and lay them down before the Father because when he was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Isn't that something? I love people who take their own advice. He was facing something 
he did not want to face. He says, and he was honest with God, please take this cup away from me. I can't do this on my own. But he finishes it with, nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. Sometime I cannot imagine what would happen if I really gave away everything. I cannot imagine what it would be like if you just, I, I can remember a time in my life that I was so afraid to give everything to God, at least in my mind, to be willing to give everything to God because I just knew for certain he was going to make me go to New Guinea as a missionary. I know that sounds silly, but the devil's going to throw all kind of fear onto you of what's going to happen to you if you really give that to God. Doesn't he? God gives us this assurance that you'll just follow me no matter where it leads, no matter what is hindering me, I've got to put it down. I've got to put it down and Jesus is saying I want you to pick something up. I want you to pick up the cross and I want you to follow me. I want you to pick up and go where I'm going. And I don't know what that is for you. I'm just asking you to take the next step. Are you willing to take the next step? I can't imagine what it's going to be like five years from now, but I pray and I trust that God is going to be able to take my journey and to take my path and to do something good with it. And if you'll give up what's hindering you, you know what it is, don't you? Don't you? Do you know what it is that is hindering you from giving everything to Jesus and to following him. If, if you don't have a clue and you don't know, I'm going to ask you to start praying that God will reveal to you what it is that is hindering you, that's stopping you from doing what it is that he wants. But everything in me, everything in me says, God, it is impossible. It is impossible. I tried it before. I tried it last year. It is impossible. I cannot do it. And that's exactly where God wants to bring me. That's where God wants to bring you to say, it is impossible. I have to get my eyes off of me, of what I can do, and start looking at Jesus and what God can do. God, I can't do it. I can't follow the commandments. There is somewhere in that 613 I am messing up. Every day when, I, when, we, when we say a prayer, I've got to pray, God, forgive me today because I did something today. I did something today I shouldn't have done. I failed to do something today that I should have done. God, it, it, and you hear Paul's word of who's going to deliver me from all of this. It's not you you're not going to deliver you. Let me have, I'm not trying to bring any discouragement. I want to bring a reality dose. You won't ever do it all right. But I'm going to tell you what. God knows that it's impossible. But he's saying, don't walk away. I know it may bring some sorrow. I may this bring some discouragement to you. But don't react and walk away. All these disciples, did they have it all together? No. Had they done some things right? Yes, they had. In fact, Peter says, God, what's uh, all of us who've left some homes? I mean, we've, he didn't say we sold our homes. He just said we've left our homes and we've left our children. We've made some sacrifices. And God, and, or Jesus turns to him and says, uh, well, really first Peter says, what are we going to get?
And Jesus says, you're going to receive a hundredfold in this life and in the life to come. I don't know about you. That's a good trade. Good trade. It's a movie called Dances with Wolves, and he had a hat, and he wanted his hat back, and the guy had to give him a, a big necklace or something, and the other had to convince him, but I was, he wanted his hat. I want my hat. He said, well, you shouldn't have left it there on the prairie. Well, I didn't mean to leave it. Now, it's my hat. And so the guy gives him, and the other Indian who's mediating says, here, take, you give him something. So he gives him a necklace, and apparently it was very valuable in that society. It wasn't very valuable to the, to the soldier, but it was sure valuable to them. And, and the other Indian comes up to him and says, good trade. <laughs> good trade. Good trade. If you think that what you will not give up to God is more valuable than a hundredfold of what God will do for you, we are sadly mistaken. Everything you've given in sacrifice, God's going to do what with it? He's going to return the investment 100-fold. When? He said in this life and in the life to come. For some people who think that, oh no, I, you know, all I'm doing is storing up treasures in heaven. All I'm doing is storing up treasures in heaven. And right now, I don't get anything. It's not what Jesus said. You may not get a hundred houses, you may not get a hundred cars, but you're getting a hundredfold of something much more valuable. There is a blessing that God gives to those who are willing to walk in obedience. Isn't that true? Amen. God's walking. He's, he's, he is moving in this congregation. He is drawing us deeper to be followers of Jesus. Not just people who come and enjoy a service in a pew. Not people who just feel good about themselves. They can do like the young, rich ruler and just say, check, check, gone to church today, check. Done this, said hi to so and so, check, did check, check. I'm going to tell you, that's not where life is. Life, eternal life, is in following Jesus. The question is, are we going to do it? And I'm going to tell you what we are going to do it. And you may not do it, be perfect. You're not doing it perfectly. No, you are not. I'm not either. But I'm going to tell you what, with God all things are possible and God is going to make me better tomorrow than I was today because I know I'm better today than I was yesterday. I know it. I feel it. If I am following him, I am going to get better. Not because I'm trying harder, but because God is working in me. You will get better because God is working in you. He's changing you. His spirit is perfecting you perfecting you. That's what this Christian walk life is all about. He's, his spirit is taking what you're willing to give and he is drawing more out of you. Yes. And he's going to draw more out of you next week than he did last week. Yeah. And if I get to that point where I don't feel like God is calling me, he's drawing me. If I'm not walking with him, I'm walking away and we've got to tell each other and remind each other, come on, brothers and sisters, let's get back on the journey. Let's get back on the path. I'm going to tell you, this is a good trade. Good trade. And I don't know how that blessing is going to come to you. It may come from a healing. It may not come from a healing. It may come from inner peace. It may come from emotional healing. It may come from things in your family. I don't know where it's going to come. See, that's not in my hands. It's in his. Do y'all want a hundredfold? Oh, I do. I, I want a hundredfold. I want a hundred. I, I can't even imagine that, a hundredfold. 
I'm so glad Peter asked that follow-up question. God, what's it in it for us? <laughs> I mean, we've been following you. You saw that rich young ruler, the guy who walked away, but we're here with you, God. He says, you, you, don't worry. <laughs> you, you don't worry about him, you worry about you. But you know what? When we start become followers, we can start making followers. And we cannot make followers. We cannot make disciples of what we are unwilling to be. Because if our discipleship in making disciples is just a box we checked, we've invited five people to church this week, check, I've, I've done that. That's, that's a good thing. I would encourage you to do that. But that's not making a disciple yet. And when we begin, when we begin listening to the Father and we're led by the Spirit and we see the needs and the yokes of bondage that are on the people around us and then we begin to exercise the authority that God has given you to break those yokes off people and they come to repentance and they hear the call and then we begin to teach them all of the things that Jesus taught, now we're starting to make disciples. And when we know we're really making disciples is when the person who has been now following that we've been able to bring to Christ, they begin to bring people to Christ themselves because they have now completed the cycle. See, it's not for us just to go make a disciple. They're not a disciple until they themselves are making disciples. This is impossible. Is it impossible? Is it impossible? It is not impossible. It's impossible if it's up to you. It's impossible if it's up to me. But it's not up to me and it's not up to you. It's up to the God who works in us and through us. Amen? Amen. There was one more healing I didn't mention. I'm, I guess I got so busy talking about all the healings that people had, I forgot to mention my answer to prayer this week. Monday evening. I hope you don't mind. But Mon Monday evening, I felt a kidney stone coming on. And if you ever had a kidney stone, you know exactly what it feels like when you start getting a kidney stone. And at first I thought maybe I'll just have an indigestion and no, it didn't take long. And by 15 minutes later, it was biting me. It was biting me really hard back in my kidney area just like a spear going through you. And, and Sherilyn had already asked, you want me to take you to the doctor? No, no, I'm fine. And then about 15 minutes later, I said, I'm going to go put my shoes on. <laughs> I'm going to put on my, get out of my shorts, put on my pants, because we're fixing to go to the emergency room. And she said, let me pray for you. She lifted me up and prayed for me right then. And I, I said, I, you're right, I need to do that. And I got that phone thing out and got on the prayer 24 hour prayer line got right on that prayer line said I need some prayer I got I feel a kidney stone brewing and it's biting me and I'm telling you those things hurt and I'm gonna it's God as my witness my wife started calling a few other people getting some more prayers from people within this church and I'm gonna tell you within five minutes the pain was gone it was gone it was gone and I'm gonna tell you that has not been my experience in the past when I've had kidney stones. It lasts for hours. God is good. And you know what? He didn't do that because I'm following and doing everything right. I'm still messed up. I've still got plenty of stuff that needs to be fixed in me. Just ask my family. <laughs> Don't, you don't really need to. <laughs> we, all, we, all, we all have our faults. But I'm going to tell you what, God wants to work with you even though you are not perfect. Even though you are not yet perfect, God is wanting to work through you. I'm going to tell you, it was it encouraging to you all to see how many people have been getting answers to prayers? It is encouraging to me because he's taking broken vessels and doing good things and that's who we are aren't we
Dallas, will you come on up here and let's go and close this out? I want, I want, if you're, if you're at that point in your life, I, I hope you've heard me. I hope everyone who's been frustrated by the messages about following me and about giving everything up and about answering the call, anybody who's left here with frustration and discouragement, I hope and I pray that God has answered, answered your cry and has answered your concern, that you do not walk away, but you deal with it and say, God, I, will, I, need, I need you to help me because I cannot imagine giving X up or Y up. I can't imagine it. I can't imagine it. Well, let God open your mind to imagine something better. And let him open your mind to imagine 100 fold in your life. I want to ask you all to stand. If you all turn the lights down. I think it is important. Praying together is important. Coming before God and saying, God, I give it to you is important. I want each and every one of you to look at me. Please, please look at me. This is important for you. It is important for you and your walk because I'm going to tell you the power, God's power for salvation is extended to you, to you. And the question is whether we will accept it. I'm inviting you to come pray. And we're going to have some time of prayer. And if you have um, healings that you still need, there are more people who need to be healed. I'm going to ask those who need a healing of some kind to either come here or go to their prayer partners as they go over there. And let's spend some time together. It's important for us as a body. And you may want to just turn to somebody next to you and say, I need some help. If you want to do that there, do it there. But don't leave here without saying, Jesus, I want to follow you. Amen.